Good morning. I'm Mark Cancy and a senior advisor at CSIS. I would like to welcome all of you to our event this morning. It's a great opportunity to have General Murray join us for a discussion of Army modernization. The General needs little introduction to this group. As an infantry officer, he commanded at every level from the company to the Joint Task Force. As a senior officer, he had a variety of assignments related to force development and programs, including as the Army's Deputy Chief of Staff, G8, which leads programming and force development on the Army staff. He's the first commander of the Army's Innovative Futures Command, which was established to transform Army modernization. The command is located in Austin, Texas, away from existing Army organizations, but close to centers of civilian innovation. It's a novel organization being structured as cross-functional teams to bring a variety of disciplines to bear. I would note that this is both an exciting and a challenging time for the Army. On the one hand, the Army has been nurturing a wide variety of new technologies, several of which are on the cusp of moving from the lab to the field. On the other hand, this is happening as DOD budgets have likely peaked, and there will be severe competition for resources between force structure readiness and modernization. Our format for our, the event today will be that the general will give his remarks. He and I will have a short conversation and finally the general will answer questions that have come in from the audience. So with that, I will turn the floor over to General Murray. Welcome. Thanks, Mark. And just a thumbs up, you can hear me okay? We can. Okay, thanks. And, and thanks to you and, and thanks obviously to CSIS for hosting this event. Um, it, it's always great to do these types of events because I always walk away with some insights and, and really from the questions, which I'm very much looking forward to, uh, some insights and some things we probably need to spend some more time thinking and working on. And I did get a chance to, to look at the list of attendees, and, and as always, CSIS has, has drawn a, a really interesting list of attendees, so I think the, the question and answer session should be pretty good. Um, and for the Army, just like the rest of the country, there's been a tremendous amount going on over the last 30 to 60 days, and really all the way back to March uh, when we first uh, got busy with COVID. And the Army, amongst all the institutions with the new administrations, understand there's a lot of change coming up. And we very much look forward to embracing that change and moving forward with the rest of the Department of Defense. Yeah, but I would like to just take an opportunity um, to thank Secretary McCarthy, who has recently left as the Secretary of the Army. Um, a lot of what you mentioned up front uh, between the Chiefs of Staff, the two Chiefs of Staff of the Army, but really Ryan McCarthy was the, the impetus behind a lot of what the Army has done in terms of transformational change and one of the biggest supporters of Army Futures Command. And in my limited knowledge, one of the better Secretaries of the Army I've ever worked for. So my hat's off and just take that opportunity to thank Secretary McCarthy and, and really the Undersecretary, Secretary McPherson. Um, and we fully understand that new administration coming in is going to bring new priorities or as a minimum, a reprioritization of the things we're working on. So there's going to be a lot of change, but I also like to think there's going to be a lot of things that don't change for the Army. Like the fact that your United States Army uh, is absolutely always has been, always will be committed to being the most dominant land power now and into the future. Another thing that won't change is our commitment uh, to being ready today while we transform for tomorrow. Incremental changes that we've undergone for the last 40 years just will not be sufficient when you look at a future operational environment and a future battlefield. And really, if you think about modernization in the Army, we get a chance about once every 40 years. Uh, in the 1940s, we did transformation with things like Louisiana maneuvers to get ready for World War II. And then the late 70s, early 80s, uh, with the advent of the Big Five in airland battle. So 80s to 2020, it's our 40-year mark, and we just cannot afford to pass up this opportunity. And the one thing we also realize is there's only one army. So there's not a future army and a current army. It's how we transform the current army into that future army. Another thing that will not change is our absolute firm commitment uh, to being a good partner of the joint force and a good partner for our coalition uh, partners and our allies. Uh, the Army is firmly committed and, and we'll talk about some things like project convergence into furthering the joint fight. And the Army firmly understands that no one service can do this alone. It's, it will be a, a joint fight always, just as it always has been. And I do think, you know, and I do this every once in a while, uh, pause to think what's been accomplished in the last three years. 
in three years sounds like a long time if you're very young, but three years is a very short period of time uh, for those of us to do this for a business. And you mentioned one of them, um, Mark, earlier in terms of the stand up of Army Futures Command. We're not quite three years old here in Austin. And we went from uh, a scratch start of about 12 of us uh, to the organization it is today. And that was all in less than three years. You mentioned the cross-functional teams, and most of you understand we created eight cross-functional teams. And over the course of the last three years, uh, what I'm most proud of is an incredible partnership that's been built with our acquisition partners, our PEOs and PMs. Because I, more than anybody else, realize that AFC, Army Futures Command, cannot deliver capability without those partnerships, uh, those closed partnerships. One of the things I'm really proud of is the Army's six modernization priorities. Um, and they're the six modernization priorities, but what I'm most proud of is the Army has stuck with them. Uh, we have not changed our modernization priorities for the time they were formed. And I have a firm commitment from the Chief of Staff of the Army that we will not change our modernization priorities. And that, why do I say that? And why do I think they're not going to change? Is because we have proven them out uh, in terms of modeling and simulation and wargaming that those are the most critical six modernization priorities for the Army. We've completed now three, uh, people variously call them deep dives or night courts, and really realigned more than $30 billion within our equipping uh, portfolio to make sure that we are servicing our most important priorities. We've developed down here at Army Futures Command a, a future operational environment when we look at the future out to about 2035 or 2040. And it is firmly grounded in the Joint Staff's Joint Operational Environment 2040, which was signed out by the chairman about a year ago. We've done a lot of work aligning our S&T investments uh, in the short term to support the Army's modernization priorities and in the longer term to really support what the, the Army has identified as our, our focused S&T research areas. And if you read the Army modernization strategies are on the next to last page and there are nine of them. We have cut the delivery time of capability for our soldiers. Uh, so if you go back just a few years ago, uh, on average, it was taking 12 to 15 years to develop, a, develop and, and deliver a capability to our soldiers. In many cases, many of the signature programs, that's four years or less. Uh, enhanced night vision goggles, binoculars, a great example from, from identification of the need or the requirement it was 22 months to have that capability in the hands of soldiers in, in operation in the Republic of Korea. Um, we've also cut the time uh, that it takes to develop requirements from on the order of five years to five months in most cases. We have instituted and often undersold a concept called soldier-centered design, and it's an exceptionally easy concept to get your head around. And it's just that our soldiers, our current soldiers, ought to be at the center of all the developmental work we're doing so that when we produce a requirements document, we know two things. One is that the, 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 cap or the technology is mature enough and that our soldiers will accept and use this piece of equipment. Because I do believe uh, one of the things we're going to see in the future is this man-machine interface, if you will. And a lot of people call it an interface. I prefer to think of it as integration. So the, the integration of our soldiers and the, the material we're producing and making sure it's fully usable uh, is absolutely critical what we're doing. We developed and published a new concept called multi-domain operations. Um, and we are in the process of turning that over to TRADOC, Training and Doctrine Command, as we speak to begin to write multi-domain operations, the concept into doctrine. We published, and I mentioned this, a comprehensive modernization strategy. It includes not only what we will fight with, but also how we will fight, and importantly, linking it to the Army people strategy. It talks about who we are. And if you think about it, three years, one third of that has been under COVID conditions. We have kept everything on track uh, with all the challenge that COVID has presented to all of us. And all the, the 31 plus four and everything we're doing right now is on track, even under those conditions. And I do think that that has generated some momentum. And so one of the things I remain committed to for as long as the Army will have me is to maintain that momentum, uh, regardless of the upcoming changes with the new administration. In our modernization priorities, as I mentioned, have remained consistent and they will remain consistent. Uh, long range 
precision fires, uh, successful testing of hypersonic missiles, a mid-range capability, uh, the ability to shoot extended range artillery out beyond 70 kilometers, air missile defense, a couple notable programs, IBCS, IM Shore Ad, the EPIC, the recent purchase of a couple of Iron Dome batteries, and then the longer term solution, which will determine this spring. Uh, future vertical lift, most people know the future attack reconnaissance aircraft and the, and the uh, future long range assault aircraft. Uh, two radically different aircraft that most people don't even call helicopters, and we're accumulating significant flying hours on the, the future long range assault aircraft today, both vendors. Uh, mo modular open system architectures for aircraft, and then future uh, unmanned aerial systems, which was really a unique approach in the putting. Uh, six different, excuse me, five different variants into soldiers' hands to determine the appropriate way forward. The network, which underpins everything we're do, we do, we're in the middle of an IOT &E right now. Uh, we'll fill Cape Set 21 this year, and then exploring the concept of unified net operations, which really links the the CONUS architecture with the deployable architecture. Uh, next gen combat vehicles, robotics, a lot been published on the robotics. And then a very unique approach to how we're going after a Bradley replacement and the way we're doing the requirement with almost daily interaction with industry and providing industry the ability to be creative in how they, they will provide us a solution. And then, of course, soldierly thousand integrated visual augmentation system has been in the press lately, a very unique way of going about that with for this type of capability, hardware, non-traditional uh, industry partner in Microsoft, I mentioned uh, EMVGB, enhanced night vision, goggles, binocular, and then of course, two new rifles, one automatic rifle, one semi-automatic rifle to replace the uh, the carbine and the, the squad automatic weapon in the Army. And I, again, a unique approach. Uh, all we provided in industry was the bullet and had them build us a weapon around, around the bullet. And that really, you know, in the interest of time, Mark, brings us to what I what I like to think of as our umbrella event. So a lot of things going on, and, and it all we try to keep it all nested under a thing we call Project Convergence. Project Convergence was really uh, first thought of by by Brigadier General Ross Kaufman, who runs the Next Generation Combat Vehicle Cross Functional Team. And it was started off with linking sensors into uh, an automated uh, target identification into the turret of a combat vehicle. And then way too late, uh, I caught on and it dawned on me that it's much bigger than just a sensor in a combat vehicle, which really, and at that time, everybody was talking about all sensors, all shooters, and all C2 nodes. Um, but how do, you, how do you link sensor data into the right shooter and only through the appropriate command and control nodes, or only then maybe even the necessary command and control nodes. Um, and the first thing when I talk about project convergence, I tell people is you got to understand it's it's about much more than just technology. Uh, technology is often talked about. That's what the articles get written about. But it's it's about technology. It's about how we will fight in the future. And it's really in many ways about how we'll organize and the talent we're going to need for the future. So we did our first iteration out at Yuma Proving Grounds last August and September. Um, and what was really exciting about it to me, uh, because it was done on a very short time frame, about eight months, is uh, the power of bringing scientists and technicians to the soldiers in the dirt at Yuma and focusing that, that team, the developers and the users, on a common problem and how fast we can iterate technology, how fast we can advance the technology levels, readiness levels, and how quickly we can actually solve problem problems if you put the problem solver and the problem owner together against that common problem. It was just incredible to watch uh, code being written every day and every night out at Yuma to solve problems. And in the end, it was a fairly simple use case. It was accelerating the time uh, from detection of a target from various altitudes um, and from the ground to delivery of, of fires. And it was what was excited about it. And watch a process that, as I grew up in the Army and to this day, takes tens of minutes. We could get it down to tens of seconds uh, through the use of algorithms, through the use of uh, target recognition, through the use of 
systems that help us identify the best shooter for that particular target. So that was the one lesson together uh, is, is putting the problem solvers and the problem owners together. The, right, the ability to write code um, was another thing that became very obvious to me. So as I look to the future, we're going to have to have the capability to write code at the edge. Um, and if you think about project convergence, it basically all comes down to the data and how we structure, handle that data and how we utilize that data. Um, so it, that's going to lead to a couple other efforts I'm talking about, but we're going to have to have the ability to write code at the edge. And I'm not talking about intele changing intellectual property. I'm talking about writing code to solve problems for tactical, tactical commanders in the future. Uh, we'll progress and we're in the midst of, of finalizing the plan for Project Convergence 21, uh, which will take place uh, this fall. Uh, at both Yuma Proving Ground and we'll expand it a little bit to include White Sands Missile Range this time as well. The, the thing that's exciting about Project Convergence 21, and I go back to what I said earlier, uh, we are focused on joint mission threats for this, for this exercise. So we have involved at the three-star level uh, as a minimum, the Air Force, the Navy, and the Marine Corps in helping us put together Project Convergence 21 and my, my plea to the Joint Forces is this is not about bringing your equipment to play in an Army experiment. This is about coming together from the very beginning to plan and execute this to solve joint problems. And if you think about it, really to inform the JADC2 effort that's going on in the building as we speak, uh, led by the Joint Staff J6. Because I do think solutions that we can prove in the dirt will work. Uh, and that bottom-up feed into the, what will eventually be decided by the JROC will be incredibly important as we move forward. And then Project Convergence 22 um, expanded a little bit further uh, to include our closest uh, allies and partners. And that's really what the Army talks about, uh, putting the, the C in front of JADC2. And it goes back also to what I said earlier is we'll never, I, I'm convinced the United States will never fight alone, allies, partners, will always be a critical thing, part of, of any future fight. And so involving them at the very, very beginning, so we understand each other's s and we understand you know, how to link together from a, from a command and control standpoint and are able to digitally pass data and information uh, between us will be critically important. Um, and then there will also be a, a part project convergence 23. I just don't know what to talk about on that one yet, but it is, in pe various people have called these exercises, experiments. Um, I, I call it a, a campaign of learning. So it's, it's our ability to learn and build upon year to year the three things I talked about. Well, actually, the four things. Not only what we'll fight with, but how we'll fight, how we'll organize, and what talent we need to begin to develop for that future Army. Uh, there will be spin outs. Um, I've got tremendous industry interest in participating in Project Convergence 21 and 22, and we're starting to, to figure out how to make that work. Um, but this is something I see continuing well into the future as we begin to build that future force. And really, it's not build a future force, it's transition the current force into that future force. And that brings me to a couple of other exciting things here at AFC, and that's the talent management piece of this. We've got uh, two tracks that we're piloting right now at Carnegie Mellon, uh, a two-year program to create uh, Army data scientists and data engineers, a six-month, really a one-year track to create AI technicians. And here just three weeks ago, uh, we started uh, the first cohort through here in Austin, what we call the software factory. Um, so in simplistic terms, which you mentioned I'm an infantry officer, so I need to think in simplistic terms is, at Carnegie Mellon, we're building people that will build out the architecture and sustain the architecture. And here in Austin, we're building the people that will utilize that architecture uh, to start to build that talent uh, for the Army that we're going to need in the future. If, if we're going to treat data as a weapon system, which I think is, is an important way to think about it. The, um, and the interesting thing about Software Factory, these are all young soldiers that were already in uniform. Um, it took me all of 30 minutes to fill up cohort one. We just closed the application window for cohort number three, and this is an every six month thing. Um, well over 200 currently serving soldiers, really ranging in grade from E3 to Lieutenant Colonel. 
um, in this last cohort's at about 50% enlisted. And these kids all have the skills, very few of them, if any of them have a degree, it's just what they do as a hobby is the coding piece of this. So we're gonna take them, refine their skills, and then the, the retention, you know, how we retain these young soldiers, uh, where we put them at the, at the point of most need and, and really, you know, how we build some sort of career field for them as we move forward is, is really kind of what we're working on now. So, Mark, I think we're at about the 20 minute mark. So I'm going to stop right there and, and turn it back over to you. Well, thank you very much for your uh, comments, General. Let me ask a, a couple of questions and uh, before we go to the audience. And the first one is one that I'm sure you've got many times, which is the Army has talked about 31 technologies, 31 plus three, and has recognized that it's not going to be able to field all of those. How does the Army plan to go from that 31 plus three to some set uh, of technologies that will actually be fielded to the troops. Yeah, the um, I, I, you know, I have been asked that, and I'm going to give you the same answer I give most people, Mark, is I, I think it's too early to say that we can't do it. Now, um, and, and I, I answered that from a, a fiscal standpoint, and, and, you know, and so most, I mean, you read the articles, um, most people are assuming, and it's probably a good assumption, that DOD's top line is is not going to grow as a minimum. It's probably going to go down. And as the Army being part of DOD may get a fair share of that, may get uh, overly a fair share of that. So I read the same things everybody else reads. Um, but I think it matters greatly when you talk about what we're going to be able to do and what we're not going to be able to do. Number one, how deep. Right. So how much are we talking about? But then I think the, the thing that most people forget is how long does that cut last? Um, and you've studied defense funding and, you know, it, it fundamentally is, is cyclic. Right. So the money goes down, the money comes up, the money goes down, the money comes up. So I, I think until we get some more resolution on how deep and how long and maybe I'm being overly optimistic, but I'm hanging on to the 31 plus four. Um, why? because we have proven uh, proven through simulation modeling experimentation that those are the most critical modernization priorities for the, for the Army. And number two is we only get one chance to do this every 40 years and we're in that window. Now, if, if forced to you know, prioritize, and I would say that the Army's done a great job over the last three years prioritizing within our top line and funding our priorities, um, it comes down to priorities. Um, and it's probably going to come down to, as you look at areas that uh, the Army is focused on, um, uh, if there's a new national defense strategy, what that national defense strategy tells us to focus on, we'll, we'll figure out what the priorities are uh, in and outside the 31 plus 4. But I would just tell you we're going to do as much as we possibly can uh, to continue to fund, uh, fully fund, our priorities moving forward. Well, and let me ask a follow-on question in that area, which is uh, about strategy in China. Uh, the Biden administration will come out with a new national defense strategy, national security strategy. But from statements that they've made already, it looks to continue to focus on China as the Trump administration did. Uh, many strategists argue that uh, the Western Pacific is mainly uh, a maritime and air theater, and that the Army has an important but secondary role. Uh, I know the chief has pushed back on that recently, and I, so I wanted to ask the general question, how do you see the Army uh, contributing to a conflict in the Western Pacific? Yeah, there was probably a lot of really smart strategists that were arguing that in 1940 as well. Um, the I think the Army has, and I agree with the Chief, I think the Army has a critical role. Not in, in, in most everybody, Mark, I would argue, fo focuses on conflict. Um, and I, I hope most everybody out there hopes that we never get to conflict uh, with China. Um, so in competition, I see a tremendous role for the Army in terms of building partner capacity, which almost certainly will be part of a new national defense strategy, a new national security strategy. I mean, if you, if you look at the heads of states and, the, and the, really the leaders of countries throughout uh, the Pacific, uh, I think the number is 70% plus 
um, are not only land, uh, land people, land centric people in terms of military, uh, army, former army or current army uh, general officers. Um, over the years, a lot of them attended our schooling. And so the relationship uh, and the ability to build those relationships, because with relationships uh, comes access. And access, I think, is going to be very important uh, if, if it ever came to uh, conflict. In, in the, I think we tend to look at conflict with China very narrowly. All right. So most of the, the you know, it's it's South China Sea, it's Taiwan Straits. I think it would be a much broader uh, if that ever happened. Would be my second point. My third point, you know, without even arguing uh, what everybody thinks of the Army as BCTs and divisions, is the joint force cannot operate without the logistic tail the Army brings. Um, there are a number of Title X responsibilities, like bulk fuel is one example, that the, the joint force is very reliant upon the Army to provide. So I think there's, there's lots of roles in competition. There's lots of roles in conflict. And I just, I can't think of anything in history um, that did not rely upon a, a pretty substantial land component in the end. Well, thank you. Um, let me ask a force development question, which relates to multi-domain operations. The Army has talked very extensively about those and. Uh, I think put together some, at least some experimental multi-domain units. And I was wondering if you could tell us you know, how do multi-domain operations and multi-domain units differ from the traditional combined arms and combined arms fires that the army has um, employed uh, traditionally. And how many, how much of that multi-domain aspect uh, will be seen at say the brigade level as opposed to at the division or uh, higher yeah. initial. So the, the, you're referring to the multi domain task force out at uh, Joint Base with Lewis McCord. Um, we stood that unit up as an experimental unit. Um, and despite the fact that we want to call it an experimental unit, it is in great demand by the combatant commanders, most uh, specifically uh, Indo-PACOM and UCOM. Um, and and it's, I think they see the promise of it. Uh, and, and as you know, multi-domain, we're now talking five domains, uh, synchronization, integration across those five domains. And I think the difference between like a, a core or division headquarters and a multi-domain task force more expeditionary uh, is a very tailorable unit to bring uh, what the combatant commander most desires. It's the integration of a very sophisticated um what we call uh, I2Qs, so it's it's really the brain of the multi-domain task force, um, cyber, uh, electronic warfare, space, um, to include normal. And MDTF, I forgot to mention, in 21 will be a prime player as part of Project Convergence as we finalize the design. Um, and it's, I think, unlike a lot of other headquarters, it is, it is able to uh, satisfy requirements, and it is satisfying requirements for Indo-PACOM right now during competition and very easily can transition through crisis into conflict to provide uh, lethal fires from extended ranges to include the, the ability to sense. Um, you know, multi-domain operations, and, and I may differ with some people on this, um, and I had this conversation two years ago um, in terms of the multi-domain operations concept. My thinking is that that concept is primarily an operational concept. Um, so it really applies to where we can provide the tools and that's probably gonna be at the core level in AS, the Army Service Component Command, Combatant Commander level, maybe some capability down to division. I, I really see at the Brigade Combat Team uh, level until we start to be, begin to feel some additional technologies really operating like brigade combat teams have operated uh, for the last five to 10 years under unified land operations. I, you know, the, the three technologies that I, that I fundamentally think changes the way BCTs fight um, 
brigade combat teams. And if you want to go this far, changes potentially the character of war uh, are autonomy, robotics, and artificial intelligence. Um, and, and I do think that provides us some opportunities. And those are here today, uh, but they're not here in scale. So I think we're a little ways away from that. So in the meantime, I think the multi-domain concept um, really is at core, maybe division and above and BCTs, although we're going to end up restructuring them slightly and we'll continue to operate like they've, all, like they've operated in the recent past. Thank you. Let, let me ask one question, which I'm going to attribute to Tom Spore, a former colleague of yours, <laughs> uh, Army uh, General, now at um, uh, Heritage. Uh, and uh, we both had the same question, which is that the Army has been doing a lot of uh, experimentation and testing and plans to do a lot more of that in the future. How do you ensure that these war games and experiments um, are really open to many possibilities and don't turn into demonstrations? Yeah, I, I tell Tom I read his article. Um, and I actually sent his article out to everybody that works for me because I agree with him. Um, and we go, we go through, uh, and I told you we're, we're working through the, the 21 exercise right now. And we're not working through adding more to it. We're working through taking things away um, in terms to make to make sure that we don't make this so big that it just becomes and you know it becomes an exercise and not a true demonstration of technology. And, and I think you got to go back to you got to remind yourself all the time, and I do remind people constantly the real purpose of what we're trying to do. Um, you know, and we're trying. It, the one thing I didn't say up front is the one thing that also dawned on me is, you know, you look at whatever system it is, just call it one of the 31. Um, you know, when you start integrating these systems, the effect that you create ought to be greater than some of the parts. And that's really what, and you can define that any way you want. I mean, General Milley talked about 10X, you know, is, is you know, you start combining stuff of 4X, 4X, and 4X is that 12. I mean, so, we can get into those theoretical arguments all you want, um, but the power of bringing stuff together, and, and I truly think that in the future, and this is not original, um, all my Air Force friends will tell me this is not original. It's just a different take on the OODA loop, right? So the, 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 app, you know, the, 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 the commander that can see first, understand first, decide first and act faster than anybody else on the battlefield is going to have a significant advantage. And that's really, you know, if you want to, you know, what we're after, that's in a nutshell, uh, one of the prime things we're after. Um, and I told you a project convergence, we spent out of that six weeks, about five weeks of it, just making stuff work. So we've, we've also recently just commissioned and built as an operation, a, a joint, systems integration laboratory uh, to where we bring all this stuff together throughout the year so we don't waste time at Yuma making stuff work and we really understand the true potential of what it is we're trying to do. But tell Tom I'm with him. Uh, keep publishing articles and I'll let him know when I disagree. Great. Uh, and he's listening. So I think he got the message. I know he is. I know he is. That's why I said that. <laughs> um, I'm going to turn to some of the questions that we've been getting uh, from the uh, audience, and um, one of them is uh, there have been a several coming in from uh, uh, representatives of allies and partners, and that is the degree to which Army modernization will be open to allies and partners, and how the Army will do that. The, um, I, I think, you know, we're off to a great start, and it's it's been a, a rocky history in some cases, so Everything from conversations through I own, uh, within the AFC, there's an organization called Combat Capabilities Development Command, uh, better known as DEVCOM. So we have opened up and we actually have had partnerships for a long time around the world in terms of where we're investing our science and technology, uh, because I think that there is a lot of opportunity for cooperation with our closest partners and allies in terms of our science and technology investments. Um, I think we have been, uh, I had allies at Project Convergence 20 uh, in terms of our closest allies. 
and then you know it's the joint staff hasn't accepted it uh, the army put the c in front of jad c2 right from the very beginning because i think you have to fundamentally understand that you have to fundamentally accept that we're never going to fight alone as the united states that our true strength is in our partners and allies and that's something our near peer opponents just cannot match us with is the ability to to bring partners and allies which which brings much more than just the, the sum of the parts like a lot of other things um you'll notice secretary austin's first call uh, when he got in, into the building um so i i think it's important and, and you take things like the network which is what most people focus on and it's really passing of digital data um, if you look at the network cross-functional team and the path we're on, there's multiple lines of effort, and one of those lines of effort is interoperability. So thinking about interoperability up front um, as not as an afterthought, I think, is the first critical step. And then I always tell people there's a lot more to interoperability than being able to talk to one another. So the rotations, uh, the, the, the rotational forces that are going to Europe, uh, Pacific Defender 2021, 20, 22, you know, working with partners and allies. So it's it's about understanding culture. It's about understanding how each other operates. It's about the the commute, be able to communicate. I got that, uh, but I just I think there's a lot more to it than just the, the ability to to be able to pass digital data over. Um, we have a question from Mr. Kim, who is. Uh, a journalist with the Voice of America Korean service. And his question is about how Operation uh, a Project Conversion will shape regional doctrine on the Korean Peninsula. Yeah, I, I, I've crossed Abe Abrams before, so I'm not going to even venture a guess at how Abe's thinking about how that will change it. But actually, um, General Abe is really interested in what we're trying to do. And, and actually, we're dealing with a couple um request from u.s forces korea right now in terms of material development um he is he's very interested in in, in we're a ways off in in ground and air autonomy uh, which would have a significant impact i would think on the korean peninsula he's very interested in the long-range fires work and the air defense work we're doing which would have a significant impact on the korean peninsula um so out of all the the sub-unified commands, and I guess there's not that many out there, but General Abrams and his staff has been very tightly tied into not only what we're doing in terms of the, the signature systems and what we're producing, but also where we're investing our S&T dollars. And Abe has been a, a huge supporter and exceptionally interested in, in how this could apply on the Korean Peninsula. Oh, great. Well, we have uh, another question. Uh, this is from Patrick Tucker, who's a uh, technology editor at Defense One. Um, and his question is about uh, small drones. He, he asks, what are the greatest uh, ambitions and greatest concerns in terms of small drones, both in using them for multi-domain uh, dominance and defending against them, particularly in urban environments where jamming and kinetic response are higher cost? Yeah, so, um, I mean, there was, there was a, a short flurry of a lot of articles and what you saw in Azerbaijan and Armenia. Um, that's not new. Uh, that was probably more sophisticated than what we saw from ISIS in Syria. Uh, but we're experienced, you know, and, and there's really uh, our efforts from an air defense standpoint. And there's also the Army has stood up uh, for the Joint Staff a, a, a counter drone, counter UAS uh, office inside the Pentagon. And, and really two different, just for background, two different problem sets. One is inside a CONUS, which is not my problem set. And then the other one would be in an operational type environment, which is my problem set. So uh, the counter drone, um, we're working the same path that everybody else is working in terms of uh, soft kills and hard kills by a variety of different weapon systems. It just becomes very hard when you start talking about swarms of small drones. Not impossible, but harder. And that's one of the cases when I, was, when I talked about artificial intelligence where there might not be a C2 node in the net. You know the U.S. has a policy of, of a human on the loop. 
uh, when you're defending against a drone swarm, that a human may be required to make that first decision. But I'm just not sure any human can keep up with a drone swarm, defending against a drone swarm. So I think that's some areas we can have some conversations in the U.S. going forward in terms of policy, um, in terms of how much human involvement you actually need when you're talking about non-lethal decisions uh, from, a, from a human standpoint. The, um, we're doing a lot of work with small, uh, what we call them attritable, which I'll translate to cheap, uh, drones to do uh, a lot of different things. Uh, small swarms right now, I think we got up to about eight to 10 out of Yuma. Um, and what we primarily used them for was to extend our mesh network. So we were replicating a division headquarters, which has by today's doctrine of uh, the, the ability to cover about 25 or 30 kilometers. We extended out to almost 70 kilometers through the use of uh, aerial mesh networks with, the, with our drones. Um, we are able to right now uh, provide a lot of different payloads, and I'm not going to go into the, on this net, but you can think of it from a, from a non-lethal and lethal perspective uh, to put on these drones. We're able to swarm right now, uh, and we'll continue to try to expand the number in the swarm as we go forward. But I think the fundamental question is, I think drones and most likely drone swarms are something uh, – you're going to see on a future battlefield and i don't i don't think it's if i mean, i think we're already seeing some of it i just think it's a matter of when you begin to see it let me ask a quick follow-up there which is that many um, followers of technology point to um, directed energy weapons as a solution for s small drones because of the you know the inexpensiveness per shot as opposed to you know a, a, a missile um, Mm -hmm. And I was wondering you know, where the Army is in its efforts on directed energy. We've got uh, three efforts ongoing right now through an organization we call the Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office, led by uh, Lieutenant General Neil Thorogood. Um, one smaller power uh, that, that basically you can put on a combat vehicle, one larger power uh, that you can put on a, a larger vehicle, obviously. Um, and those are the two primary ones. The, 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 the problem with, and I, and I think this is throughout the world is, um, well, I know it's throughout the world, um, is the number one is the, the power that has to be generated um, because right now lasers are some of the most inefficient pieces of electronics out there. And so you, you never get 100% in, 100% out. It's, it's always something less than that. So we've got some science and technology efforts working that. And the other piece is because it's not efficient, it creates a tremendous, tremendous amount of heat. So how do you cool it? Um, and then the third problem is how do you store enough energy uh, to really make it efficient? So those three uh, problems turn them into very big systems. Um, and so if you're putting it on a ship, I mean, you got the room, you got the power. If you're putting it uh, in a fixed facility, you can build the, the room and the power. The problem becomes how do you make these things mobile? Uh, we're going to uh, field some prototypes here pretty quickly uh, to begin to experiment with and see if we want to make the investment uh, from a, a, obviously you mentioned from a counter small UAS. I mean, we've been doing that out at uh, an exercise we call MFIX at a four sill for probably better part of five or six years and looking what's available through the defense industry. Um, and then we'll, we'll run through some experimentation, uh, to see if we can start to fix some of the problems with it. I, the one thing, you know, on, on lasers, I also think is it's, it's, it's never going to be the sole solution because of atmospherics, weather, uh, et cetera. So you're always going to have some mix of gun, missile, laser, I think. And so here in a couple of years, we'll have, I think it's four prototype vehicles produced, and, and we'll begin to experiment with them to do two things. One is understand you know, how we intend to fight that, um, the organizational structure we're going to have to build to support it. And then third one, and most importantly, is, you know, before we write a requirements document, what's the state of technology and, and what are we actually going to tell industry we want them to build for the long term? 
Great. Um, we have a question from uh, Lieutenant Colonel um, Frankel, if I'm pronouncing it right, who's head of the innovation branch for the uh, Israeli Defense Force. And he, uh, to paraphrase his question a little, uh, do you see any changes to the way the Army, any long term changes to the way the Army uh, conducts operations as a result of COVID 19? Certainly, there are near term changes that have had to be instituted, but at some point, everybody's going to be vaccinated. And we hope move beyond this. Do you see long term changes? From, from an operational standpoint, I don't because, I mean, General McConville has said for a long time that, you know, you can't commute to, to training, you can't commute to, bat, to war. So I, I think from an operational standpoint, COVID is not going to have an impact. But from an institutional standpoint, uh, one of the things that, that I have found, so we've been on various 60 to 85 percent telework since last March. Um, and I, I to be honest with you, I have not seen a drop in productivity uh, from my workforce. Not not a bit of it. Now, maybe I wasn't asking enough of them before. Um, you know, that remains to be seen. But I, but I do think um, and just about every engagement I've done has been virtual like this one. Um, so if you if you think about, you know, if budgets are going to be tight, um, how much money could be saved if we take a fresh look at how we do remote work um, and how we do virtual engagements versus flying people all over the country and renting cars and staying in hotel rooms. So I think from a, from a business standpoint, I certainly hope that COVID will have some long-term impacts on the institution. Great. Uh, we have a question that I think came from a couple of people. The one I'm looking at is from Ashley. I want to say rock. Uh, from Jane's, and it's maybe a bit unfair, but we'll ask it anyway, which is uh, that the Biden administration, of course, has only been in uh, office a couple of days. Uh, but do you see, on the basis of what they've said so far and what they said during the campaign, any changes to Army modernization that might occur? Um, and I expect Ashley to ask an unfair question, so that's that's right in line. Um, yeah, it, it is too early to say. Um, and and obviously, um, last fall, I was reading everything I could get my hands on, uh, published by CSIS and other other think tanks out there. Same thing. I mean, I, I was reading uh, both sides uh, of where, you know, depending on which administration came in before the election. Um, I, I'm fairly optimistic, and I've, I've told other people this before, is and, and I hope everybody got a chance to read a recent article that came out. I won't mention the author that, you know, the, the Army has made some really tough choices over the last three years to align our resources against our most important priorities. And, and there's, there's a case to be made out there, you know, that we did it right. Um, and so I think we're on a great path from a modernization standpoint. And you didn't get to the question that I thought you were going to get to in terms of, Where's the money come from, if not modernization, right? Um, so, and that's that's the tough decisions, the chief, and for now, acting secretary, uh, and eventually secretary of the army, are going to have to make in terms of, you know, is it structure, is it readiness, or really is it modernization and equipping? Those are the three big pots. I mean, yes, we spend money in installations. Uh, yes, we spend money on on people. Uh, yes, we spend money on family support, but if you look at the three big places money can come from, that's really those three. Um, and it's it's all about squaring that triangle. It has always been about squaring that triangle. It will be about squaring that triangle. And it's just, there's no easy decisions. As hard as the decisions have been over the last three years, there's no easy decisions coming up for our senior leaders in terms of, um, you know, where that the resources come from if if they're significant enough to, to force them to make those choices. I, I do think, uh, I know, uh, the chief, uh, he talked about it at USA, he talked about our chance to get is committed to the, the army has to transform. We only get a shot every 40 years. I've said that ad nauseum, but you know, it's, we got great momentum in a lot of different areas. Um, and we're going to fight to sustain that momentum as, as much as we possibly can. Great. Uh, I'm going to ask a question here yeah, um, from Steve Trimble from Aviation Week. And this is a question that's come up uh, in many venues. 
and it's uh, uh, about the Army's development of long-range precision strike and whether there should be a rebalancing of funding from the Air Force's long-range strike programs. And people have raised questions about um, roles and missions and you know, where the Army and Air Force should delineate their long-range strike uh, capabilities. Yeah. The, um, yeah, as much as I love to advocate uh, for that, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to get in the middle of, you know, the service, the great service rivalries, but I, you know, it's when we develop, and that's why I say we've done the modeling simulation. So, um, and I didn't get into this, which I normally do is, you know, uh, it really started with next generation warfare study we did with what happened in Ukraine and, and the use of, and really the building over time of, of, I would I would argue first in Russia and then quickly followed in China and it may be a chicken or egg thing. Um, but this, and it, it, this concept of an operational defense and most people refer to this operational defense as anti-access aerial denial. And it, it comes from both of those countries studying the American way of war since about Desert Storm in terms of how we like to fight. Um, and, and it was it was taking away, and it was really all about that operational defense that really separates the joint force in time, space, and function, and most importantly, function in terms of the American way of war. Um, so when we began, and I told you the modeling and sim we've done, is how do you begin to take down that operational defense because at least from an army perspective, and I think the other services would agree is that defenses are great, but you, you don't win in the defense. You win in on the offense and in, in some form of maneuver, be it on the ground, the air, or the sea. Um, so how can the army almost reverse roles with the way we fought desert storm and operation Iraqi freedom and begin to take down portions of this air, area, uh, aerial denial, uh, anti-access aerial denial complex to open up windows of opportunity for the rest of the joint force. And specifically, the rest of the joint force would be, you know, the Air Force strike assets and, and long range assets. And so I, I think they're actually complementary and not contradictory. And I don't think you can I, I think we've got to have both. Um, now, I'm not getting into numbers, but I think from a capability standpoint that you have to have both capabilities. And, and the same thing for some of our mid-range capability. Uh, if you look at, you know, targeting moving emitters, uh, whether that be on the land or in the sea, to open up corridors of, of freedom of maneuver for the joint force, I, I think is is incredibly important and you know that's kind of our feed into the developing joint warfighting concept as well. Uh, great well we have a couple of industry related questions. Um, uh, one's from John O'Grady former army officer and former CSIS fellow and uh, also James Parks uh, with uh, Collins Aerospace and both of them ask uh, how can industry you know, better engage with AFC and will AFC continue to hold these industry days, which I gather you held back in December, which seems they found uh, helpful. Yeah, the one thing O'Grady didn't tell you is former uh, Devardi commander for one two-star General Murray. So there's, there's a loaded question there. He, um, he also added Rock of the Marne, sir. Uh, to well, that, yeah, that's the third infantry division. Yep. I'm, I'm, I'd be disappointed if he didn't. The, um, and, you know, and so we, we've been engaging with industry over the last two weeks, and I've got a number of, of engagements coming up. Industry obviously wants to understand what the Army's problems are, um, the problems we're trying to solve. Um, and that was the industry day we did back in December, and it was really an, an outbrief of Project Convergence 20. Um, we did a, a – uh, strategic fire study. Uh, the industry is getting a look at that, I think, either tomorrow or sometime this week uh, in a classified format. Um, I've been engaging with at a major industry engagement last week. I know who John works for. If, if they would like to do something very similar, I'm more than open to that. Um, and we got to really start figuring out 
how to how to get industry involved. Um, and, and we have mechanisms to do that. Uh, they're called CRADAs. I mentioned the, the Joint Systems Integration Lab. Uh, industry has right now investments they'd like to make in further term capability. And they have systems right now or capabilities that they think are ready to go prime time. And so the whole point of that, that systems integration lab is get stuff on the network to make sure that it all works and we can connect it. And if it does, you know, we'll go through the process of figuring out how to get it into uh, a proof of principle. We had a couple of questions about AI and how the Army is incorporating AI into its modernization plans. And also, you know, how do you see AI changing Army operations in sort of the midterm and potentially in the long term? Yeah, I think um, midterm or even short term, because I mean, artificial intelligence for the, at least in terms of narrow uh, artificial intelligence is obviously here now. Um, and it's just, you know, the application of broad artificial intelligence, I think is, is growing. So, I mean, I use this story all the time. It's, it, my first step was, um, well, let's, let's back up just a minute. Um, we need to catch up with the civilian industry in, in their use of artificial intelligence. Things like, um, you know, maintenance that becomes more uh, predictable. So, you know, the algorithms that, you, that every plane in the sky flies with right now that, that automatically tells the airport the plane's landing on if there's something wrong with the plane, what parts need to be on hand to fix it? And it's driven by profit, right? So getting the plane off the ground, back in the air with more passengers on it. So that predictive prognostic maintenance piece of it, we're, we're pretty good on our aviation fleet. We're terrible on our ground combat fleet. So just some early adoption of things that commercial industry is already doing. Um, midterm, I think it's primarily decision aid. Um, and so... I think, you know, if you think about a future battlefield, the one th way I've described in the past is it will be hyperactive. Uh, so it will be, I think decisions will be, have to be made at such a pace that it's going to be incredibly difficult for a human decision maker to keep up with it. So in terms of understanding that first part, understanding of what's going on in, the, in, the, in the, really across all five domains to include cyberspace, um, AI can aid tremendously to include what's going on in open source as well. Um, I often go back to the, the automated target recognition, and it's not a um, terminate, Terminator type technology. It's the ability to, to acquire a combat vehicle and then help the operator or help the, the kid sitting behind the trigger identify exactly what type of vehicle that is. Um, and I, and I go back to growing up in mechanized infantry formations. We used to do, a uh, any new gunner got a test and it was, it's flashcards, just like I learned my math tables, you know, and there's pictures of various armored vehicles on the flashcards and you went through 15, 20, 25, 30 of these. And if that young soldier got 80% of them, right, he was put in the gunner seat of a, a very lethal vehicle. Um, the algorithms we trained out at Project Convergence were, were routinely getting 99 to 98% correct. So in many ways, AI has the ability to make us safer. Um, the way we do airspace deconfliction, I think, is a short-term victory we could get uh, in terms of, because right now we just block off big blotches of airspace to deconflict it. We could be much, much more precise um, with, a, with some sort of algorithm that helps us go faster. Great. Well, we're almost to the end of our time. We have, uh, I think, time for one last question, which uh, will also be John O'Grady's, but I think it's a good wrap up, which is how are you going to find, how are you going to define success for uh, project convergence? Yeah, well, that's, you know, it's, it's hard to define success for a campaign of learning. Um, and so we've, we have variously described different ways of defining success. Um, I, I think one important measure of success is uh, the continuation. Um, I think one measure of success is that it does not turn into a network integration experiment, which we had less than perfect success with, uh, better known as NIE. I think one measure of success is um, 
how we're able to spin technologies out of project convergence. There's a couple items in that we experimented with last fall that I think uh, with some additional S&T investment uh, could drive it. And then I think probably the, the, the biggest measure of success is um, how it drives the Army towards that modernization goal of 2035. You know, and, and I look out 2035, and, and I've told this to people before, is, you know, if you want to look out 2035, I, I'd be happy to listen to you, but you have to agree with me and I have to agree with you, is we're both going to be wrong, right? So there's no way anybody knows what 2035 is going to look like. And so the ability of project convergence to really drive the Army along this journey to 2035 and base it upon what we're learning as opposed to what we wish would be in 2035, which uh, we've gotten ourselves in, in problems with that before in terms of what we wish would mature by 2035, what we wish the world would look like by 2035. So it's really the combination of all the efforts. That's why I call this the umbrella event. It's, it's as we look at, um, begin to predict what that future operational environment could look like, and then establish waypoints along the way to make sure that we're keeping up with what's actually happening in the world. Uh, same thing with organizational structures is, is begin to think about what that, you know, the types of units and the numbers of units we're going to need in 35 and then adjust as we go, hit waypoints as we go to keep up what's actually happening in the world. And the same thing with technology. Um, and, you know, as multi-domain operations becomes our doctrine, um, I'm personally convinced, and once again, there's people out there who disagree with me, we're going to have to almost constantly evolve, not not completely change, but evolve multi-domain operations just because there are more technologies coming that are going to really change, I think, warfare in the future. Quantum computing, quantum sensing, bio, bio, uh, synthetic biology, um, just to name a few. And so I, you know, the days of doctrine lasting for 40 years, I think, are gone. Uh, we're almost going to have a, a wiki page for doctrine, right? So we'll just keep it constantly updated uh, because I, two things I don't see changing is the rate of technological innovation. Um, it's the one thing. And then I talk about a lot of things that won't change, but that's, that's one thing that we're going to have to keep pace with and, and we won't do it under the old way of modernizing. Well, thank you very much, General. Our time has run out. I look forward to continuing this uh, conversation in the future as the Army rolls out its modernization program. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. No, thank you, Mark. Thanks to CSIS and, and really thanks to everybody on the net today. And then once again, I wasn't disappointed, disappointed, some really great questions and great conversation.